So with kombucha, you usually would use like really uh, you know, bad white sugar. <laughs> um, but I I just get like the organic kind of uh, just evaporated cane sugar and. It's uh, you know not advisable to use any other sweetener really. Like if you're using coconut sugar, it'll work out, but you kind of have to um, re uh, replenish your scobies um, with the white sugar. So and I don't like it very sweet, so I'm doing a little bit less than a cup or three quarts of water. So the scoby, just in case you don't know, is a symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast. So it's it's uh, it's not a mushroom. It's, so he's alive. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a symbiosis of um, you know um, beneficial bacteria. Mm -hmm. So uh, they feed on sugar and tannins. So uh, we're just getting it going here. This uh, yeah, this all has to cool before we can do the finished steps. We want to show you all at the end. Um, so we're just going to add uh, this sugar and black tea um, and let it steep and cool. For the next, you know, a uh, couple hours, while we go chat and have tea and do other things. Turn off the heat the sugar um, you want to leave the heat on? I just turned it right back on because it was boiling. Um, but I uh, let it dissolve, and then you turn the heat off and add the tea. And one aspect I like to incorporate in my medicine making, my food making, whatever, is like that. But it's not vibrational cooking the way that mom's food tastes better because she puts love in it. You know, just a little, you know, chant of like, oh my God, you know, you know, the helping to my piece or something to put into the medicine. And so as we stir it, that's kind of like the witchy thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> and for three quarts, this is a recipe to make a little less than a gallon of kombucha. Um, you want to do four tea bags or four teaspoons of tea. And this is um, this is two tablespoons of uh, organic Turkish tea that my sister brought me from Turkey. Oh, nice. Thanks for sharing that with us. <laughs> well, you'll get to, we might have some that are ready that we made well, from see. before that we can share a little bit of, but these, this won't be ready for a couple of weeks still. So, that will just chill now. Did you turn it back on? Uh, yeah, we can turn the heat off now. Yeah. So sugar's added. Just take it off the heat. Thank you. And can you use different kinds of tea? Ideally, it has to be black or green tea because um, the black tea and the green tea are really high in tannins and. You can, uh, the caffeine too, I think, is something that the sugar eats. You could probably eats. use uh, oak bark or grape leaves. Yeah. And, uh, if you didn't, um, you don't want to use that black tea. Or and there are but other it eats strains. The caffeine. Yeah, there's other strains of uh, the scobies that um, they'll eat the different kinds. Like there's something called Jun, which is J U N. It's uh, some other. Uh, Forget where it's it comes Japanese. from. Japanese culture, and they use honey instead of sugar. Mm -hmm. um, but honey will kill this kind of colony, mm -hmm. so you have to use, you have to feed it white sugar and the black tea. So, mm -hmm. and we'll show you a recipe from a book we have that has a little more information on the black tea. It's really important to use organic black tea because uh, the not organic ones spread with sprayed with pesticides are very high in fluoride and that can imbalance the not just you and your body but the uh, symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. Mm -hmm. So it's important to use uh, good clean water and uh, organic tea and, and your vessel, organic sugar. Your vessel is important too, you know, you should uh, have you know stainless steel or ceramic um, and if you can, you know, and just cooking in general. Other things will leach, you know, into your food or into your medicine. You can, you know, in the case of medicine making or making ferments and stuff, they can imbalance, you know, what you're working with. Yeah, and using a wooden spoon, and then when you brew it, you have this over here that I can show you. Um, you're going to add 
after the sugar is dissolved and the tea has steeped and cooled, you will put a half cup of kombucha from a previous batch and you'll stick it into a glass jar or if you have a big glass bowl that you can cover easily, that's fine too. Um, maybe a wooden spoon. And you're going to put your SCOBY. We'll talk about how to make one of these if you don't already have one. This is really interesting. You see how it kind of has the shape of the jar. It's a, like a round plate shape. And you'll put that in there with your half cup of kombucha from the previous batch and your uh, brewed sugar tea. And you'll cover it and leave it for, you can see I put a date on here, you're going to leave it for um, 7 to 10 days is what most people recommend, but I like to leave it for about 2 weeks because it gets uh, a little more soured and cultured, fermented, uh, more probiotic, it tastes better that way. And so yeah, I put the date on there, highly recommended, <laughs> so you don't forget. <laughs> and then I just put it in a cool, dark place where it's not going to uh, get exposed to light and a lot of heat uh, for those two weeks that I brew it. I poured yeah. off a sample here that um, we can all take a spoonful of this to taste it. Um, I personally don't think it's quite ready yet, but some people like it this sweet, so I'd like to offer a sample of that. It's uh, important to note too that depending on temperature, the temperature of your kitchen or wherever it's at, it may go slower or faster. Depending. Yeah, that's going to be the case for a lot of the events that we're going to talk about today. Yeah, everybody's kitchen is different. And just yeah. anecdotally, we're experimenting here with a, a vinegar, apple cider vinegar as well. Mm -hmm. so move that out of the way. So that's a similar process, but it's. Neat. It's even easier. You just um, uh, dissolve sugar in water and then put, you want to fill up your vessel like three quarters worth with uh, apple cores or peels or you know just like apples themselves and then uh, you leave it for two weeks and you, know, you just stir it every couple of days and then you take the apples out and let it keep going until you get the desired, you know, uh, uh, vinegary flavor. Right now so. it's still kind of like a sweet apple soda it's <laughs> bubbling and doing its job in there. Well, you see the apples are a little bit above the water line. You're supposed to stir it, is it once a day? Every two to three days. Two to three days? Yeah. To, to keep those kind of below and keep them mixed up and keep them from growing mold on top. You don't want them to uh, form any strange most of these formats, you want to have uh, it covered and have a couple of inches worth of room at the top of your vessel for it to like, you know, it's going to make all this gas. Mm -hmm. you know, so um, it needs a, and it kind of expands too. going to be added. This is another experiment. That we've done this before where you left a kombucha from the store out on the counter. And when you do that, it starts to uh, cultivate the mother that's in that bottle. So they call it a mother. Um, we put that in here, and it's growing its own scoby on top. It's really thin, just like the one I just passed around. But if you don't have a scoby, you can grow your own. And uh, the way to do that is leaving that kombucha out on the counter long enough that it'll develop more than if they were just in a refrigerator. You can just take it straight from the mm -hmm. fridge and put it in. We've done that before, and it's going to scoby just fine. Yeah. Because it's going to have that, you know, li those little bits at the bottom of the kombucha that's little mothers. So. Um, I, I wanted to offer everybody a sip of this. Oh. Two, two, okay. Um, so, I usually like to start off uh, the whole fermentation talk with just uh, keying into. Um, the aspect of the four elements, because this is something we try to share throughout all of our teaching, because we see it as a connected framework, you know, and it was the architectural, like philosophical, natural philosophy of all traditions across the world that have this, like, earth, wind, fire, and water as our, you know, the matrix of our creation and our being. Um, so, um, we see 
fermentation is being very much connected with the earth element in that whole way of like Rudolf Steiner and his, you know, thought of we're basically plants that make soil in our bellies because the microvilla on our root, are, on our intestines are exactly the same as the rootlets on trees for taking up nutrient. <laughs> um, and it's these probiotics that are also the lactobacillus that is on the surface of all the tables and our skin and the vegetables and all the leaves and everything. The environment is like this medium between like the soil and nourishing plants and trees as well as nourishing our bodies. And we're on like a we're uh, like a tree also in that you have to nourish your root if you want to expand and grow and be in, in great health. So now they're finding that like 70% of our uh, serotonin or more is created by the intestinal flora in our gut. And so, you know, there's all these kids that are like having all these challenges because they don't, they've been, you know, they've gotten antibiotics their whole life. They've been washing their hands with Purell, you know, they've, uh, they didn't get colostrum for their mother, they didn't breastfeed, you know, and so and they have really high sugar diets, mm -hmm. which can really cause an imbalance in the gut biota. Mm -hmm. and so that you know brings forth the autism and the you know manic depression and a lot of the things that kids and adults are working with. You know, so it's this whole we see it as this you know kind of beautiful also connection of nourishing the soil, you know, and life cultivation, taking care of you know the soil in your gut, so that you can bring more of yourself, so you can go out and cultivate more. So, just a little la 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 about that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't not. <laughs> I can't help myself. It's fun too because, it, like my friend Dandelion talks about, you know, how we all have this spora, which is like uh, we all have bacteria and, uh, you know, fungi and stuff that's like endemic to our body. And so when we hang out in group, we share our spora and we become more biologically resilient because of it. Um. <laughs> Does he know how to open the door? <laughs> that's, that's sad, oh yeah. <laughs> I call him a teenager in black skinny jeans. <laughs> <laughs> He's super smart, and sometimes he gets him in trouble. <laughs> so the other thing about uh, that connection is that um, with the fermentation is that in your gut is where most of the serotonin is formed. And so that's why probiotics can be like an antidepressant kind of thing. It just helps your cognitive abilities, it helps your uh, your mood and like your immune, your immune system. system. It's kind of like another you. It's like this culture inside of you. And if you're not basically once we stop culturing our foods and we move to pasteurization and, and you know the whole kill all the bacteria movement was when we really started to see a lot more, like an increase in degenerative diseases. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot about a lot of information about that in this book here that yeah. we like to pass around. This is uh, Nourishing Traditions by Sally Fallon, and she collected the works of the dentist, uh, Dr. Weston Price. And he, what he did was he went and studied uh, several indigenous cultures around the world and he saw that uh, once they were introduced to industrialized food and food that hadn't been prepared like you know their their culture had done for generations in, in, within one generation they noticed a huge difference in uh, the degeneration of uh, the children that were being born their teeth were to, falling out yeah their teeth were bad their skeletal structure like they would be born with scoliosis mm -hmm. um, and they would uh, have more frequent colds and uh, other diseases and so it was amazing how they you know they found that each culture kind of had a sort of similar uh, way of eating and they all have their fermentations that they do like they didn't just eat wheat in large quantities like we do today without fermenting it so sourdough for instance will is a culture that will digest the gluten in the bread and that's why you know when people don't eat sourdough bread and they're eating this mass quantity of wheat all the time that's mm -hmm. been you know 
denatured in so many ways, including brominated, bleached, all that kind of stuff. Or like um, they they don't they can't digest the gluten obviously because it's it hasn't been pre-digested for them by culturing it with sourdough culture. And there's this whole thought we like to impart of like, you know, regaining our culture or starting a new culture, like a new paradigm. And part of it is it's not new, it's the old culture. It's using these cultures, you know, your that actually inform us and bring more of us to the table, you know. So um, <laughs> yeah, we're all about that, you know, and there, it's, if you just look at the indigenous ways of people using things across the world, they always did things for a reason, you know, like our use of corn. Uh, if you don't nixonalize corn <laughs> and you eat it as a staple diet, it will, de uh, it's a degenerative disease called pellagra that forms, and it's like your skin wastes away, you know, you basically fall apart. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, or even like oats in Ireland, people would harvest the oats and put them like on the back porch. But it's raining, it's Ireland, it's always wet. And so they'd basically start sprouting and start fermenting before they even made them into you know, porridge or you know, what have you. So um, these, you know, uh, <coughs> feel, we feel like are a part of bringing back our culture. <laughs> and it's interesting that it's called culturing. You know, veggies and such. So, um, like this is another whole. really cool one with dairy products and dairy intolerance that's rampant in the world today. This is a 400 year old strain of kefir, milk kefir. And right now you can see it's separated. Um, uh, this is the whey, and this is the grains, and the, the milk that's going to you know, be strained out. It's already been cultured. Um, but my friend Willa brought this back from Turkey. It had been in Russia for 100 years and in Turkey for 300 years. And this family had kept the strain alive. So it's this, you know, generation upon generation, they pass it down and that's their thread of culture and how they, you know, stay healthy. And uh, uh, it's kind of like an oral tradition where you're, you know, telling a story and you pass it on to generations and you're creating history in the process, right? So we get to take part in this uh, really old culture that was passed down from generation to generation and is still alive and being nourished in our kitchen today. <laughs> and it eats, it's another example of people with uh, <coughs> intolerance to, you know, sensitivity to casein and lactose. Mm -hmm. The uh, kefir grains eat the casein and lactose and create lactase. Um, so um, it becomes digestible for those people most often times. If you can't do dairy, you can do at least uh, counter grown uh, kefir. Um, product from the store, you know, it's we're all aware of probiotics, you know, I'm sure to a pretty high level at this point, but um, n most people aren't really you know, privy to like if you just get like some yogurt at the store, um, you're basically just getting uh, two kinds of lactobacillus. You're getting acidophilus and bifidus um, in quantities of, you know, a billion or a trillion or whatever. Um, whereas when you do this kind of culturing, you're going to get a panoply of all kinds of uh, different lactobacilli. Um, and your, your body works in this way of like a consortium. You're actually, I think it's uh, something like two thirds of your cellular material is actually beneficial bacteria that's not you, that is necessary for your functioning. Um, so, you know, it's really important to feed these organisms. The, uh, they're called lactobacillus because they create, as a byproduct, they create lactic acid, which is beneficial to the body. And when we ferment uh, veggies in this way, instead of doing it like the old style, you know, uh, in vinegar, or not old style, it's more the new style, the industrialized style of doing it with vinegar and high heat and all that stuff, it makes it a very acidic pro uh, product. This is alkalizing, it increases the abs uh, absorption and mineral uh, availability of all the food and it creates new mineral in the form of the microorganisms themselves, which is a lot of B vitamins and 
um, all this stuff. So uh, eating it really is important for uh, help, uh, keeping things like Crohn's disease and um, leaky gut syndrome. Are, those are all connected with this thing of like non-permeability, non-assimilability through like uh, the colon, you know, um, ascending or descending. And the, um, it's nice to get uh, all the different kinds of probiotics you can. For instance, the kefir has kefirin in it. And kefirin is one of the only probiotics that will get down into the lower GI, get past the stomach acid and into the lower GI, where oftentimes people, you know, never get um, any uh, probiotic. Um, a lot of them won't survive the stomach acid and all that. Yeah, and a lot of people aren't into, like, colon hydrotherapy where you're getting you know, probiotic um, enemas or, you know, stuff like that, you know, um, which would be another way, you know, this is a way that is a lot more powerful for a lot of people to just drink some meat for you know? um, So, um, yeah, it's it's just interesting and intriguing to me that, like, how, like, the ancestors knew all this stuff because they had, this was, like, just part of what they had to do all the time. This was the way you make food stay longer. You know, is doing this like the fermentation process. Um, so for winter storage and stuff, and and um, it was usually eaten uh, in combination with heavier foods, like as a condiment. Like you'll see, like you know, sauerkraut with bratwurst or kimchi with you know, uh, uh, sashimi. Uh, sashimi. <laughs> you know, um, or you know, something like that, where it because it has. Uh, enzymes and the probiotic themselves that will help digest that more heavy food, you know. Um, yeah, so um, we're going to show you two different ways to uh, do this lacto-fermentation uh, thing. Um, there's going to be the traditional sauerkraut uh, route we're going to take, and, but first we're going to show you this uh, brining method because you can do this with any veggies. Um, uh, you can even do it with fruits, but the, with fruits you really need whey. Um, and you can make whey by just taking um, yogurt and uh, putting it in a cheesecloth and in a sieve over a bowl like this and letting all the liquid drain out. And the liquid that falls to the bottom will be whey. That's what this way, is here, that's, which is that's way at the bottom. We could strain that out of kefir too, but it's easier to get it out of the yogurt. So whey is basically pure lactobacillus. So it's a way. It's like uh, doing mushroom cultivation, where you have a, a sub a, a substrate like your veggies, and you're just uh, putting your inoculant of lactobacillus in it. What we're going to do today is going to be without whey. We're going to, and this we prefer to share because it's the most simplistic, um, and it's just as effective. And what we're going to do is use a saltwater brine to keep uh, the veggies clean enough that the lactobacillus can take over, and then um, they'll populate. And the lactobacillus keep pathogenic bacteria away. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an uh, anaerobic fermentation process. So um, it happens underwater where there's no air. And like you could see with the vinegar uh, uh, in the kitchen, how bubbly it was. That's, you know, essentially the farts of the <laughs> lactobacillus. <laughs> and and they're, you know, what they're ex excreting is the stuff that's a benefit to us. So it's uh, one man's, you know, uh, trash is another man's treasure kind of a situation. <laughs> and all life just feeds life. There's no thing outside of life that, you know, isn't beneficial to life itself. So if you guys would like to bring ferments home today, um, we could just run these through some hot, bubbly, soapy water real quick. Yeah, that's probably, probably better. Would you please? Yes, so, uh, I'm going to pass around some stuff for everybody. We're going to get everybody involved because it's more fun if we're all playing. And if um, everyone's just watching me. 
So what we're going to want to do is uh, cut the veggies up uh, to roughly equal sizes. That's the main thing here. Um, and we can, yeah, I wish I would have been a little bit more prepared, but it's okay to go on the fly. <laughs> Does it matter like size? Like, it doesn't matter. Size? It doesn't matter size as long as it's equal. Okay. Essentially. Like, is the smaller the better? Or um, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 really okay. six okay. and one half a dozen of the other. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I would say like your bigger veggies, like you know, try to get them to the size of almost what you're gonna make the the. Uh, um, Asparagus, okay. at, you know. So you can do this with any veggies. Uh, we've done it with like salsa. We've done it with. Um, uh, you can do it with like lettuce. You can do it with avocados. You can um, any fruit or veggie. You can apply this method to. Um, you can, we've done ones that are like kind of Asian style, you know, like, uh, cauliflower and peppers, and, and uh, you know snap peas and uh, ginger and garlic and soy sauce in with the ferment, you know, and those are nice, you know, um, you can do them like sort of like uh, Hispanic style, you know, with chili and corn and um, green beans and, you know, so the sky's on your imagination, you know, just what you want to do um, in terms of flavor and stuff. Um, do like you know the spicy kimchi or what have you and you just want to leave like an inch or so at the top inch and a half um, so that we can I can have that room to breathe and bubble up. but I love this method because it's super duper simple um, and that you just get your veggies you put them in your jar it's important that we keep clean this whole time but it doesn't have to be, you know, overly so. My friend does this in his van who lives, you know, uh, in the forest year round and, you know, makes a fire every night and, you know, uh, so if he can do it, we can do it. <laughs> um, and you just simply take your filtered water and the ratio is a tablespoon of salt for every cup of water. And you can do less. It doesn't have to be salty. Sometimes that's like an overpowering saltiness. Well, they do say that if you're not going to incorporate whey, it's better to use twice the amount of salt. Yeah. So uh, we have eight cups of water here, so I'm going to put eight tablespoons of Himalayan salt. It's good to use a quality salt like sea salt or Himalayan salt, uh, iodized salt. Uh, can give your uh, ferments a lot of problems. Uh, kosher salt is another fine one. But it's really important for everything to stay below the water level so it's not exposed to oxygen. It's a anaerobic fermentation. Yeah, and they make all kinds of great fermentation like uh, doodads and here you can get you can get these little cups that have the bubblers that will, uh, with this method, you have to go and burp it every day or two. Just open up the lid and let the, the gas off gas. But you can buy little uh, ones that have lids like this that have a bubbler, like you would use for fermenting, you know, beer okay. uh, or wine. Um, that just that has an airlock and lets the gas escape, but nothing comes in. Um, you can also get like the cool fermentation crocs, but I find that that's better for stuff like uh, sauerkraut. And that's really a fantastic way to keep your sauerkraut going, because all you do is you uh, uh, you keep eating on it, and as, as you take out, you also are supplanting new cabbage and ingredients. And so you may have a sauerkraut that was started like three or four or five years ago. It still has some of that cabbage in it, you know. But um, just keep it under crop. Yeah, you just some that's people what do that. I don't like to do that. <laughs> that's <laughs> what stuff gets kind of funky. That's that was by and large the way people did it across yeah. the world from before. You know, 
as they would have their fermentation vessel, and you would just keep adding. Uh, and like German set won't even consider a sauerkraut done until it's been sitting for six months. You know, so this fermentation method, I find it's like good for like a month or so. You know, it, they continue to stay good after that, but they get more and more saturated with water, and they get like you know like this. Not crisp, they're not crisp anymore, they're like kind of watery and crispy. Kind of you know? yeah. So if you're fermenting fruits, uh, you know, which includes yeah. cucumbers, you want to eat them within about uh, two months. Cool. But like he said, the, the sauerkraut might not even be ready and, you know, to your liking, the flavor that you want uh, within six months. So it, it varies from you know veg, vegetable to vegetable or fruit vegetable uh, whatever fermentation process you're doing. So with this though, you want to give it about three days uh, with the brine over the veggies, and then uh, check it from there. It shouldn't take much longer than three days. Some people like them really fermented, um, but once you once you get it to where you want it to be then you stick it into cold storage. So it's going to be out on the counter for the first few days, and then you, when, it's, when you feel like it's ready, you put it into your refrigerator is really the best place to store it, but you can store it in a cool, like a root cellar or something. So this, you'll want to demonstrate with yours. You'll uh, top it off and leave room at the top of the jar for it to uh, bubble and it might overflow when you open it up. Okay. We've had batches of veggies where we open it up and it just starts fizzing like a beer or a soda where it's just <laughs> coming out, like exploding out of the jar. So what I recommend is you open it over a bowl uh, or something to catch the juices because it will likely start fizzing out of the jar. <laughs> You'll know that it's ready at that point for sure. <laughs> I come up behind and like pass this around. around. <laughs> Bring lids Salty out juice. Here. <laughs> All there is to that, you just so put a lid on it and wait a couple of days. And I know with pickles there is like some sort of a seasoning that you can add to keep the crispness. Um, yeah, so the crispness thing, um, a lot of people <coughs> use uh, pickling salt, which has lime in it. Okay. And that does the trick, but that's um, it's not something we really suggest that in terms of like this method you can okay. uh, um, you can make uh, lacto fermented pickles that stay crisp um, yeah I know there's a season uh, I don't I want to say it's cumin but I don't think it is or tartar or mustard something. seeds mm -hmm. will Must keep them uh, anything crispy. with a little tannic uh, once again that tannic acid yeah. thing like um, oak leaves grape leaves mustard seeds um, yeah. I'm curious to try like making a green tea brine and see if that would you know keep pickles more yeah. more crisp. It's also better if you you know can get small cucumbers and keep them whole, you know tricks like that. Um, but this lacto fermented <laughs> method, you know, um, we actually just watched last night a fermentation video of this guy Brad, who's like some chef somewhere, um, uh, making. Pickles, and he was testing them on all of his, you know, kitchen crew for their crispness after a month, you know, and they were they were holding up to like, their standards. <laughs> so, uh, you pass me the brine, Jesse. How much salt did you put in? He put one, one tablespoon per cup of water. Okay. So when you have a jar full of veggies, you probably won't use more than a cup of water. the vegetables will displace it. Um, but if you have to use more water, you can. Mm -hmm. You probably have about a half a cup in your jars, maybe a little less. So there, I filled it to the, to the rim. Just make sure everything's covered with water. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to be uh, checking it for doneness, I get a spoon and I just kind of push things down, make sure it's below the water line as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And you want to cover your jar tightly and uh, be careful when you open it. 
A lot of people say to not cover your jar tightly, but this is an anaerobic uh, ferment, so you want it to really, you want to expose, you want to keep as much air out as you can. Um, and that will help it to uh, ferment properly and not grow molds and other funky things in there. Yeah, I don't, I've never seen the need to open it for, you know, before the three day period unless you have a really warm environment and then you, uh, it's going to ferment a lot faster. Um, but with this, I don't think it's going to need, you know, this time of year, it will need to be open before three days. And oftentimes with the sauerkraut in particular, what I notice, and I see it with these veggies too, um, is there's a change in color. The vegetables suddenly look different. They have a, a different color to them. Um, like you can see the color of this cabbage was green. It was green when I put it in there, but then it turns kind of a yellowish, uh, and I know it's done. With purple cabbage, it's uh, like a dark blue when you first put it in there, and then once the uh, lactic, lactic acid is uh, really proliferating in there, you can see it turns to like this bright pink, um, mm -hmm. like a magenta color. It's really beautiful. So the cucumbers, uh, I would recommend eating them within a two month period. Um, the sauerkraut, on the other hand, it'll stay good for years. Yeah, um, potentially. And the other uh, vegetables, they will stay good for a really long time too. I've never, just, I've just never had them last longer than you know maybe a year at the most. Mm -hmm. I don't usually leave a fermented vegetable thing in my fridge for that long. You know, it gets eaten up a lot faster than that. <laughs> how do you how do you tell if it's gone bad? If you will You'll know the smell. You'll know. If you open your jar and it does not smell like something you want to put in your mouth, don't put it in your mouth. <laughs> That's, uh, you know, with small batch uh, uh, fermentation, you really don't get a lot of uh, problem with uh, things going bad. We've had, in the whole time we've been doing this, we've had one batch of sauerkraut where we opened it up and I have no idea how it happened, but it just smelled horrific. So I just <laughs> took it straight out to the compost, dumped it out, and buried it with something so that I could <laughs> smell it wafting out in the yard. <laughs> yeah. But usually, uh, you know, the small batch thing works really well. And, you know, as long as you keep your hands clean and you're not uh, introducing any kind of other bacteria in there, like you don't serve yourself by sticking your hand in the jar, right? You can get like a spoon or a fork or something. Yeah, don't Take double dip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't drink right out of your jar. <laughs> if you see anything funny growing in there, you'll skim it off the top okay. and everything else is fine and safe to eat. Uh, there's a lot of times uh, that, you know, you'll find something kind of funny like a mold growing on top and if you just skim it off and toss it out, it's fine. Everything below the water level. Should be fine. Carefully skim it. You should. <coughs> Anna's very careful with everything she does. Yeah, don't stir it. Other in people there. Like, like myself need that careful note added. <laughs> yeah. um, and that's one thing I would say about like the sauerkraut with respect to trying to, you know, tell whether or not, you know, it's done or if it's good or not. It's like um, once again, it'll smell really bad if it isn't. But some people may be confused by what smell, what the good smell is from what the bad smell is, because fermenting uh, cabbage is pretty farty smelly. And you know, just to know that that you know is something you'll kind of look for. We had an instance once when we were beginning to ferment and we were working at the ski hill at the at the, uh, the snowboard, snowboard shop. The shop. <laughs> and, we broke for lunch and opened our sauerkraut and like there was a whole bunch of people in there and it just smelled like just terrible <laughs> farts going, oh, and people were like what's going on what is it what's happening here and, it was like, and then somebody walked in they're like I smell sauerkraut so so yeah but there is that noticeable tangy smell that uh, you know it's after it's fermented, it smells different, not just uh, the cabbage smell. So does this get like a vinegary taste then to it at all, or no? No, okay. so it, it won't have that vinegary flavor that you're accustomed to with pickles. Yeah. Um, and that, 
it's an important thing to note. This is the way people get pickling the foot, you know, all the time until, you know, 100 years ago. Okay. Or something. We started adding the vinegar to it? Yeah, and that, that was mainly to, you know, because we were moving into like an industrialized, you know, situation where, we're, you know, it's such big quantities of food they had to be careful about, you know, spreading disease. And it was a lot harder with, you know, these big batches of ferments and stuff. So they went to, you know, uh, cooking it to kill, you know, the life force in it, and, you know, um, so that it doesn't have that potential of okay. and vinegar. And that's really like acidic and, and harsh, and it doesn't have these benefits that we were getting, you know, for millennia through pickling <laughs> that help us digest and populate our, you know, oh. intestinal bacteria. So, you know, the rise of immunological problems, you know, degenerative diseases, mental health problems, you know, there's a lot of it is connected to this, yeah. clearly, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why we've, you know, for us, it's, you know, that same thing of, like, with you, the interest in, you know, living, you know, from the land, living from the farm, you know, and the wilds, and, you know, putting stuff up and having a method by which to do it that's like, simple, you know, but also um, having a, you know, we're just as eager to get the health benefits from, you know, doing that. Mm -hmm. So, because um, it's connected, it's connected to our physical health. Mm -hmm. you know, um, just like, what's wrong with me today? It's like, oh, I forgot what I did yesterday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> did everybody get garlic in their jars? Mm -hmm. I did. Did everyone did? Okay. There's some. The garlic doesn't do? kill the bacteria you're looking no. at? No. Mm -hmm. So there's a few things like that, like the honey, like I've done ferments like this before with almost the same ingredients, but I did it Asian style, where I, you know, put like chili flakes and soy sauce and honey and ginger and uh, basil, and it came out great. It was fantastic. It was like more flavorful, you know. Um, so, but we were worried that the honey, you know, because honey is antibacterial, antimicrobial, um, antifungal, you know, but it seemed to do okay. It'll and, kill some things and not others, I guess. Yeah. And it's um, like, you know, it'll kill the strain of uh, water keeper. So you can't make water keeper with honey. You have to use sugar mm -hmm. uh, or coconut sugar. Um, but yeah, they put honey in it, it'll kill the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah, all these things are across the board, but, um, uh, you know, and there's room for experimentation. We do a lot of that, you know, with this, you know, this whole thing. You can bring in your, firm, like, your wild, you know, and a lot of you are from our wild crafting walks. You can bring in the wild things, you know, your, your cavites or, like, you know, um, personally, or, yeah, nettles or, you know, whatever you got, you know, wild greens, um, those are good in there too. And just as simple as could be. So, yeah, I'm glad you're going to get into that. I, I wanted to urge people to try those because they're really good. And, and next we're going to go over the sauerkraut here, which is essentially the same method, but we're going to use the juices from the cabbage itself. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. So the the uh, quantity here. Here's the book. Do you remember off the top of your head? Um, so again, if you're going to do a quart jar of sauerkraut, which is about a one medium-sized head of cabbage, you're going to use a tablespoon of salt. And if you're not using the four tablespoons of whey that they recommend then you would add another tablespoon of salt. Um, and you can see uh, you're going to pound the sauerkraut. Everything we're passing around here is just the juice from the cabbage. It's not, you know, we didn't add any brine. But if you don't get enough juice out of the cabbage to cover it in your jar, you're going to want to uh, add, make a little bit of brine and add, I, I think, what is it, a 3% solution or something? Yeah, uh, yeah it's 3% solution, but I think this solution is pretty much that. So um, we need extras, we have it here. And uh, what the nourishing tradition suggests is one tablespoon per cabbage. 
Um, uh, so we did one and a half cabbages, but it also suggests additional tablespoon if you're not using whey. So and that's we'll, for about a quart. See, it says it needs a quart. Yeah, quart-sized jar will hold about one cabbage. So this, I'm going to do. I'm going to do two tablespoons on this because I think it's going to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, way better than stuff you buy at the store. It's way better, yeah. way more flavorful. You can do what you want with it too. You can spice it up the way you need. Totally to do it. That's the way. It, that's the kind of thing I like about it. Is I can, I can go to the store and buy like, you know, five cabbages and do them five different ways, you know, and it's just as cheap as if I bought one, yeah, you I'm know, jar you to yeah. taste this at the yeah, store, a, you know, and I get it. Yeah, that was first. Oh, okay, first thing. <laughs> you know, so it's a great, great thing, you know, it's Whoa. trying to find these win-wins where we're, you know, helping uh, prolong the shelf life of food, so thereby kind of helping you, we're helping our biology, you know, by taking it, you know, and potentially helping the culture by a simple thing as, you know, finding some vegetables. And I love these little nodes of power that, where we can, like, regain our sovereignty, you know, mm -hmm. just by, you see, I like this ferment in the garden. Mm -hmm. Eat some weeds and, you know, lay in the sun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> these things make us stronger and, like, you know, better, happier. So I'm pulling out, uh, things like this that are like really big chunks, <coughs> you just chop those again. Yeah. Some people like to use a mandolin to slice their veggies, but you just want to get it as consistently sized as possible. If you have really big chunks in there with the little chunks, there, they won't, uh, they'll just have like a different texture, they won't ferment as evenly. Yeah. They'll still ferment and it'll come out okay. Uh, doesn't cause a problem, but it's just that thing of getting a nice even ferment. Well, and the the, um, the more surface area that the bacteria has um, to cover, the, the, the more evenly it ferments, I guess. And the more uh, lactobacillus you get to enjoy. Sandor Katz talks about that. He goes into why he cuts it so small and why he prefers making things smaller than uh, leaving them in, in large pieces. I wish I could quote him on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and this is a, a, approximately going to make two quarts worth of cabbage, or worth of sauerkraut. So we, we went and got our, you know, our chicken scraps the other day, and they threw out like four cabbages, perfectly good cabbages. Well, you know, you just peel off the out, outer layer and wash it up and, you know, um, so it's all about finding, like, our other bent obviously is permaculture and it's like fun to just find these <coughs> avenues and resources that are free, you know, and aren't being taken you know, advantage of that can be, you know, benefit, you know, mm -hmm. get, you know, get all those kitchen scraps, you know, if you have or are savvy in grant making an organization at the level that I'm not, you know, <laughs> uh, you could, get, you know, gather food from all these, you know, sources and make permits for the new people and give it away and, you know, help them with their mental health. And, you know, I get delusions of grandeur with, like, us re-envisioning all the cityscapes to be, like, big food for us, with free food for everyone. You know, classes where everyone <coughs> just learns how to you know do all the stuff and we all pay it and has a garden to live in. <laughs> so you can see I've mixed in the salt here and now I'm gonna start and like push down on the cabbage. Now that I have it kind of evenly mixed in there and I'm just gonna really pound at it and squeeze it. And you'll know it's uh, done. You wanna do this for about ten minutes or so. Um, not constantly, but as much as your hands can handle, <laughs> um, until all the juices are squeezed out, and then you let it sit for a little while, and add some flavors, and smash it around some more, and then pack it into your jars, and while you're packing it into your jars, you're going to be smashing it some more, and getting more juice out of it, 
Um, and if you still don't have enough liquid at that point, then I would suggest adding some of the brine to it. And you can to top it off. You can get tools too that you can buy, or you can create. You know, like they they make these wooden mallets, and you can just you know smash it with a mallet sort of a thing. But you can you know easily you know gather one and form them too. You know, as long as it's um, I wouldn't use things like pine. I would use things more like hardwood if you were going to make an implement. You know, but um, just because the pine is going to reach out, you know. And flavor your food. <laughs> oh, I'm going to carry this around and show everyone how it's getting uh, juicier and it's shrinking. The, you know, the bowl was about this full. Okay. Shrinking and it also has a different sound once <laughs> it starts oozing yeah. its juices out. Sounds, Sounds like weird. rubbery. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Like that guy Brad says, like walking through a puddle of mud in your rubber boots or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you can see how, how much is shrinking. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's some probably not much juice at the bottom yet. Yeah, not yet. So Let's squeeze it some more. So cabbage is really in the cabbage <laughs> family, which is most of our vegetables in the grocery store, is very important to either cook or uh, do some kind of uh, salt marinade mm -hmm. because they have goitrogens that inhibit your thyroid functioning and can be problematic. Um, a lot of raw food is eating like tons of broccoli and a lot of uh, uh, unprepared broccoli or cabbage can run into problems. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that oxalates? Is that what well, the goitrogens are? Spinach, I, it might be in the brassicas as well, but the uh, the goitrogens are things that inhibit your thyroid function. So they're, they're present in the in the brassicas. <coughs> only as far as I know. So heat and salt gets heat or salt, yeah, mm -hmm. destroys the goitrogens. Mm -hmm. the, or this salt, you know, marinade and smashing, you know. So kale salad, you know, you can do the same way, like where you just like massage it with some salt first, and then you add, you know. And you could make a you could make a kale kraut, you know, same way. Just rough it up a bunch in the bowl and then you know, stick it in the jar. You know, if you need to cover it with salt. But, um, it's fun that way. You can kind of like this guy's. Um, we love the kids love our lacto fermented salsa because everything tends to get like more like effervescent and mm -hmm. and more flavorful mm -hmm. because it just kind of opens it up. You know? And uh, so. That's pretty cool because then we can sneak probiotics into the kids. <laughs> it's all about that when you have teenagers. And I was like, how can I get to like being healthy? <laughs> yeah, if you haven't started them off early in life mm -hmm. appreciating cultured food, we did pretty well. It's kind of a hard thing but to do when once they get older. But we get a lot of parents asking us, how do you get your kids to eat fermented food? Because they Mine won't touch pickles. <laughs> it's all about that, though, you know, like making making the foods they like, but then like doing it to help. And you could do it the healthy way. It just takes a little creativity, time, maybe. Mm -hmm. you know. okay. And that's something we're we're big into too. Is this <coughs> this whole idea of like the slow food movement and slowing down <coughs> our food, like mm -hmm. realizing the connection with it. And, you know, right here, where you can see it. How much more fun is it to like? Have your friends over and yeah, juice in there together yeah. and sit down. It's starting you know, to juice a lot. Really awesome, you guys did yourself. And so we like, can let it sit after a little more massaging. So it's best to cut them in big sizes. Um, <laughs> you, you, you can do it smaller. On like, yeah. yeah, the smaller you do it, the better, I guess. Um, you don't want it to be like pureed, obviously. You spend a lot of money. Yeah. Whereas you get like more. You can do it in the food processor and just make like little chunks of the cabbage. Yeah. <laughs> How much moisture are you going for? Yeah. Um, what I'm trying for is to get it covered in its own juices. Wow. Yeah. So after I let it sit for a little while, that's going to happen. Huh. Um, and then once we pound it into the jars too, you'll you'll push down on it and the juices just cover it. Like they just up. kind of come out and cut it up. And, and if we don't get that, sometimes that doesn't happen. If we don't get that, I'll just add a little brine to it. Mm. Do you want to fold in the herbs yet? 
Not yet. We're going to let it sit for about five or ten oh, minutes. Oh, yeah, that's right. I got that step. I'm supposed to let it sit. <laughs> Pretty crazy how much came out. Mm -hmm. Right? Like when you just showed us, there was none in there. So. Mm -hmm. And how much it shrank. And yeah. The bowl was like filled to the uh -huh. top with the cabbage, and now you can see how a whole cabbage will uh, shrink down small enough to fit into a quart sized jar. Mm. Well, you saw how this was separated the grains and the whey. They call them grains, I'm not sure why. But it's like these little uh, lumps of cottage cheese looking. Uh, I thought it was rice. It was like yeah. Rice. Um, <laughs> yeah. For whatever reason, it's called kefir grains. It's not an actual grain. Uh, and I'll, I'll strain it out. Now that I uh, mixed it up and incorporated the whey into it again, it's more liquidy and the grains will get um, separated uh, and be more easily strained. Pour it into here. Ideally, you would have a strainer that is not metal. Um, it, it, I guess something about it inhibits the growth of the culture, but uh, it's, I haven't found it to be uh, enough to really avoid metal altogether. So there you have the keeper grains. This is that 400 year old culture. They're big lumps. If you had gotten your own culture offline, um, it, it might be like a dehydrated powder that you would uh, have to grow for a few days before being able to make a batch of keeper with it. Um, it would be much smaller than this. And sometimes these can get to be like uh, big sheets or big balls of um, uh, culture. Like here's here's kind of a big lump. It's not that big, mm -hmm. but some of them are really big and some of them are really small. And as you can see, what I've done is I strained my old keeper batch that I've had going for about a day and a half. So I'm confident that it's ready. And then I will. Uh, I recommend rinsing your jar every couple of batches. You don't have to rinse it every time. So I dumped it in there. I rinsed it last time I made a batch. I'm going to put the grains right back in there. And I will cover it with milk. But before I do that, uh, if anyone wants to take some home, I'll put them into a jar for you. So the you can see I have almost two cups of keeper grains here. Um, you really only need about two tablespoons per, uh, it's just under a quart that you pour at, over it, about three and a half cups or so of milk. Um, but I, you know, I'm just keeping the culture alive and making small batches of keeper. So if I can, uh, I have enough to offer to you all if you want to take some home. But it's also fine if I just use all of this with you know two and a half cups of milk it's not gonna it might come out a little bit stronger than if I use more milk and a little bit thicker in the texture consistency um, but with each batch of milk more of these grains grow kind of like the kombucha scoby mm -hmm. so this culture is also a scoby okay. a symbiotic culture colony Funny of yeast and bacteria, or bacteria and yeast. <laughs> and you can eat just the, the grains and get you know, some benefit and from that. Another jar. I'll pour this into another jar. And that's what I'll go to when I'm going to make a smoothie or something. I'm going to take that out of the fridge. Because I'll have... I'm not going to put this part into the smoothie. It's, I'm going to keep culturing that. Um, yeah, and I have, just keep it. you can see how it's not very thick. It's almost, it's like between milk and yogurt. I prefer it a little thicker than that. Um, this one came out a little bit thicker. Uh, but what I noticed is something with this culture in particular. This is raw milk and this is homogenized, pasteurized milk. And uh, my friends who brought it back from Turkey 
uh, I'm pretty sure at first anyway, I'm not sure if they continued it, they were using homogenized pasteurized milk. Um, it seems to me like this, these, this culture adapted to that. Mm -hmm. Because every time I try to make it with raw milk, it comes out really thin. And uh, the with pasteurized the milk, it's homogenized milk. It, uh, you know, often with the raw milk, it's uh, there's like a layer of fat on top that uh, needs to be stirred in all the time. But with the homogenized one, it comes out thicker, and it's like, you know, I guess it's some homogenization. I'm not really sure what it is, but the keeper seems to like it more and have a, a better result. Mm -hmm. But I personally wouldn't otherwise recommend using homogenized milk. Um, the other one, the other thing I've used is raw goat milk from my friend's farm, and not I've used it from different farms, but this specific uh, farm, the goat milk that they have for whatever reason produces this really thick. It's like yogurt consistency where you can you have to Super spoon it out. Calorie. You can't what, drink it. That's what my friends had in towels. Right? Yeah. <laughs> So when these will survive at room temperature, it should be um, perfectly fine. You okay. Leave it in, the, in your car all day. Okay. Uh, and that you normally put that in the fridge then? Uh, I would normally put it in the fridge once it's done culturing, but you can't. You don't have to put it in the fridge. Okay. Um, you can culture it in the fridge too, but it'll just take a lot longer. Okay. Uh, you can fill the jar with milk sour cream. and just leave it on the counter. Um, and leave it on the counter for about 24 hours and check it. If it's not thick enough to your liking, okay. leave it for another 24 hours or even 12 hours. Good to give it a good just shake. Checking it. Checking it. Okay, um, yeah, stir it. Important to shake it or <laughs> stir it. Um, and that's... Uh, did you try the one? They used to make no, kefir in no. bladders, and they would hang it above the door so that every time the door opened and closed, they would shake the kefir. Yeah. <laughs> so keep it on your calendar and just tend to it. That's what we do is we just have all of our, I mean, you can see our kitchen is kind of ridiculous, but we have like, <laughs> you know, our ferments going and our, you know, our medicines up in the cupboard, and we're just constantly like checking on all the things. And so. Oh, yeah. When you put your milk in there, you're going to want to give it a really good stir. Um, most people don't recommend rinsing your keeper greens in between batches because it slows down their growth. Um, but if you ever think that they're like just too, like they start smelling funny or something, you can rinse them and just put them in a new batch of milk. Um, when it rinses, it burns pretty regularly. Yeah, like every few batches. Uh, and I usually, uh, you know, not, not because they smell funny, but uh, just to kind of give them a new start. If, if I'm going to change the kind of milk I'm using, I, I will rinse it in between uh, the two different kinds of milk. Mm. Um, but that should be good enough stir, and then I... Again, I put a piece of masking tape and I label it with the date. And uh, with keeper, this is I'm need to point this out. With keeper, you don't want to cover it uh, all the way, but just leaving. See, this lid doesn't have a seal on it. I'm just leaving the lid kind of not all the way closed is enough. You can also do like we did with the kombucha and put a cheesecloth over it until it's done. Uh, but once it is done, then you would close the lid tightly and put it in your fridge for cold storage after straightening it out. Um, Just a cheesecloth is enough? Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I, I sometimes, uh, either I don't have cheesecloth around or there's like a lot of bugs in the summer, for instance. So I just put the lid on there and just don't close it all the way. And that's, that's enough. That'll leave enough. Uh, this one is anaerobic, so it does want air. To come in there and circulate and be stirred, and um, mm -hmm. it needs the oxygen, I guess, to uh, culture properly. How long can you leave it with the grains? Um, I have sometimes I'll make a batch of keeper in my fridge with the grains in there, 
and the cooler temperatures slow it down so much that I can, you know, I can leave it in for like a month in the fridge. Okay. Like and if then we're when just I come back to it, it's done culturing, but it's not rotten. So. If we're just like kind of too busy, you can just mm -hmm. put them in there and put them in the fridge. And then okay. you can just, you can strain off what you need as you need it. You yeah. Know. Mm -hmm. um, or you can pull it out of the fridge and start a new batch and, you know, once you can interact with it. But if you can't interact with it, you can still, it'll still continue culturing in the fridge. Okay. You just want to replace it with fresh milk every now and then. Okay. So it doesn't, you know, otherwise it'll eat up all the milk and it'll uh, be really difficult to uh, separate the really thick keeper from the keeper grains without rinsing it and uh, handling it a lot. Okay. Um, so you just want to make sure that you strain it off maybe once a month or so. And okay. If you, if you can't do it every day or every other day, mm -hmm. every few days. Yeah, it gets to be this thing like you've got all these little children. You're like, oh, I can't go out on Friday because I've got to go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. My ferment. Maybe <laughs> 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 my well, the friends are like, what kind of lame excuse is that? <laughs> will, the culture, will the culture survive a freeze? Like if you uh, put it in the freezer? I think it will. Um, you can get like freeze-dried keeper greens mm -hmm. uh, online, but uh, I I like to keep it uh, at room temperature. Uh, because it's happier, warmer. Yeah. Surely. It's kind of like putting it any other living thing in the fridge or, or the freezer. Or it's like, mm -hmm. it's a little too cold in here, I'm not so happy. <laughs> Some things like the frog are just like, okay, cool. Yeah, right. Yeah. We found out a long time ago you can freeze frogs. and. They'll stay alive. Frozen and solid, and you can like play it with it like a popsicle and leave it on. And then it'll like. <laughs> we had a frog to <laughs> grow out of eyes in our mushroom growing operation because we were growing uh, oyster mushrooms a long time ago. And we uh, got the frog to eat the flies. <laughs> the, the person at the, what is it, the pet store, I guess, was saying you could freeze them, right? <laughs> well, not that frog because it was a tropical frog. Oh, okay. That we were Another using to, to mop up the flies. Yeah. <laughs> But, but most frogs. <laughs> so this I'm just going to go stick it on the counter and when you take your jars home just pour milk over them, stick it on the counter and check it uh, for doneness um, in the next 24 to 36 hours. Mm. And keep it out of sunlight too. I was going to ask if, you, if any of these were sensitive to light. Mm -hmm. All of them will do better yeah. in the dark. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Yeah. Cool dark place. Have well, you ever had it just go bad? Like you had to just no. rinse the grains off that? No? I have had some batches that smelled <laughs> like something I didn't want to drink. It wasn't <laughs> terrible, but yeah, I did rinse the grains. More like bread, you know? Yeah, huh. it was like really yeasty smelling. I probably like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's probably not bad. It's probably just fine in terms of like its you know, health benefits and everything, but it just gets. You know, I, I think that's what happened. We, we'll notice is the whey will separate out, you know, and sometimes there's like more whey, and so I think maybe it might just be that more whey is being produced, and that's kind of that leads to that bready smell. Okay. I don't know. I mean, no. Probably good for your dogs, too, a little splash on it's, top of their food. Absolutely, mm -hmm. very much so. And, um, it's just, yeah, it's just a, you know, it's a health, it's long been reputed as a, as a health supplement just whey but what you'll get at the store is like uh, dehydrated whey or you know and it's not the same it does not have anything like when you would just like get whey off yogurt or off kefir mm -hmm. um, totally different thing and then yeah you can also use it like we said like to do all these inoculations for like different different ferments and particularly fruit ferments mm -hmm. so you know you can kind of kill two birds with one stone you know Get the benefits of the left out of the kefir, pour off some whey, you know, and have it for making some fruit, you know, ferments. And that way, you have like, you know, you know, like your different, your veggie ferments, your fruit ferments, your kefir, your kombucha, and you're constantly in a stream of like different kinds of uh, probiotics. And even if you just put one down, do one for one month, and then you pick one up, another one up, like you're still getting that. You know, population inside you, and then it can grow and develop. So next, we're gonna just finish off this sauerkraut um, that we started. Now that it's set for a while, and we're gonna start first off by herbing uh, uh, it. So we're gonna do it another because this is our favorite one, the the dill garlic mm -hmm. one. So mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's, you know, Hana likes to eat it on her eggs. Um, oh, well. You know, eggs and, eggs and avocado toast and this, or, you know, there's a, uh, it's good with heavier meals like that, you know. Um, trying to think other ways you'd like to do the sauerkraut besides oh, yeah. just the traditional like she Hannah's Austrian so sometimes I'll just do a batch like this one that we passed around only has caraway seeds to flavor it and it's just a little pinch of them some people will recommend like the recipe in the book that we passed around I think recommends putting one or two tablespoons of caraway seeds Mm -hmm. I tried that before and I thought it was gross. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, juniper berries is another way that mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. like to ferment their sauerkraut. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes juniper berries and caraway seeds. That's like the but, traditional, like, way German yeah. style. So you could get like a quart jar and put like between three and ten juniper berries. And that would be plenty. Mm -hmm. um, and that makes a nice flavor. Kind of like a gin. <laughs> I guess. I mean, I don't really. It's more like don't drink gin. It pairs so. more with like you know, with like kind of that German cuisine of like rye bread and like, or okay. like, maybe like a, a Reuben sandwich or something like that. Yeah. You know. Um, so uh, I'm just kind of I'm doing what I call the uh, troll method, which is just like this is a I don't know what do you call that. That's two big pinches, <laughs> you know? Maybe half Maybe a teaspoon three. ish. Maybe two and a half pinches. Yeah. You don't really need a whole lot. It's just a, a nice flavor. Mm -hmm. And it also, the mustard seeds will kind of keep it a little crispier. And I like, for sauerkraut, I like to press the garlic in there. You can smash it, you can slice it. Uh, uh, I don't like to put whole cloves in there, but you can also do that. You get more uh, flavor if you press it. Mm -hmm. uh, come in infused into the uh, sauerkraut mm -hmm. than if you, you know, slice it or just put it in whole. Because it's once again opening up more surface area. Mm -hmm. So the ferment can get in there and, and uh, you know, do its thing. So, and we're not going to do red pepper flakes because Hannah's doing But you're welcome to add those shades. to your jars. But if you want them for any of your jars, you're welcome to it. So, um, and now we just fold it in together. Yeah, I think that's and everything we you want to put, right? I'm worried that I... I just washed my hands, so... Yeah. Let's get so. nice and juicy in there now. It's not looking as juicy as I'd like it to, so I am going to add the brine yeah. before I put it into the jars. Before? Yeah, because I, I uh, since we're packing so many small jars. Mm -hmm. If I was just going to put it into one quart jar, then I would pour it over the top. Yeah. But since this is going to go to many small jars, I'll get mine over it in the bowl. I'm going to listen to it again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's no longer like squeaky rubber. It's, mm -hmm. it's more like soft cabbage. <laughs> Really juicy. That should be good. I'll show you how it's covered in liquid. And we're going to be pressing it down in the jars too, so when you press on it and the liquid rises to the top, then you know that that's, that's a good amount of liquid. <laughs> So you put some of those seeds in the too? Uh, yeah, the mustard oh. seeds. Mm -hmm. So I can't put my hands all the way down in this one. I can in a wide mouth jar. So ideally, if you're going to be using these narrow mouth jars, you'd have like a pounder. Yeah, I mean, what does it look like? Yeah. I get the juice This would be suitable for, you know, making crowd too. <clears throat> it's just for my juicer, but that's the kind of thing you would look for. Essentially, is just a stick you could smash with. <laughs> I love sort of the simplicity of all of it. It's just a 
get veggies chopped. Add salt. Smash with stick. <laughs> All better. Let's see the, the one and a half cabbages. We'll fill about two quarts worth. And then I'll pour brine on top of it. It's floating, but it's covered by the water, so that's okay. Mm. You can really pack these jars, uh, but since we're trying to distribute it, there's not enough apparently to pack all the jars. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to top it off a little bit. And then again, you can. Uh, um, check on these in a couple of days, uh, maybe like My two days, every, yeah. once, once you start seeing like a color change, then you're going to want to open the lid and uh, check for doneness. If it starts bubbling out, it's really effervescent, then it's, it's done. But you still, even if it's doing that, it might not be done enough to your liking. You might want to leave it. Uh, some people will stick it in their fridge and not even check it for about six months, and some people will uh, stick it on their counter for like three days to two weeks, depending on the flavor that they like to come out of it and depending on the temperature and all that of your kitchen. So just check on it at least uh, every day or two. Could it be in a cabinet like with my kombucha yeah. and stuff? Yeah, you just want to, with the sauerkraut, it's another, is it uh, anaerobic? The one that doesn't like air. Okay. Um, you, wanna, you want it to have a tightly covered lid and okay. keep it under the water level. Make sure that if it rises up, you just want to push down on it with a spoon mm -hmm. or something. And just keep everything under, under that water level. So. Simple as pie. Nice. <laughs> and we can uh, show you guys the recipe too, so that you can refer back to it. For mm -hmm. Yeah, if you want to take a picture of it from my book, or have you? Yeah, the recipe is in our book. I'm not sure how many of you have our book already, but yeah, oh, there as I well. think so. It's the same one at the airport. Okay. you bought. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome, friends. What we would like she was saying, what we do if we did this in a court jar, just take this leaf that we saved. And just, uh, folded in over as a lid over that, you know, kind of like that, mm -hmm. or you can fold Keep it like this, you know, and fold it in half, and whatever the case, you, that gives you another little buffer, mm -hmm. and if this just goes bad, you just, you know. Put in the compost, yeah. I'll feed it to your chickens. I'm not so sure about the kombucha thing for today. We can definitely talk about it and, uh, it's not done it's, enough. It's just not done enough for me to want to strain it off. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just save that tea at this point because of that. Um, and we I'll can actually, we could do it the other way with just the reserve oh, kombucha. Oh, yeah. yeah. Let's do that real quick. We could do that. Yeah. Here. And I can take one of these scobies out. I'll be right back. You don't really need to double it up, but you can if you want to keep the maximum amount of bugs out of there. <laughs> Stretch that over and hold it in place with a rubber band, just like I have this one here. I'm just going to fish these out with my hands because my hands are clean. This is our cooled uh, sugared black tea. Did you strain it through the uh, coffee filter? No. This, the, with the Turkish tea, I use a coffee That's filter so just to keep the. Um, the little particles out of there. Mm -hmm. um, 
function as well. So yeah, you get your strain T and your reserved kombucha from your previous batch. And if it's uh, cooled to room temperature, which this one should be, um, you can add the SCOBY at that point. Um, but you just want to wait till it's cooled off enough to do so. So I'm going to wait to pour the tea in here and make sure it's cool enough. And once it is, I'll grab a SCOBY out of here. And because I have three in here, so I'll put one in each of these jars. And it's okay that they're the wrong size. They're going to grow another SCOBY that's going to fit to the size of this jar. Um, but I'm going to leave the third one in here because, like I said, this one's not done. And it'll continue to culture with that third SCOBY. And how do you use this coming? So that's that's what the culture is that's mm -hmm. imparting the lacto uh, the lactic acid for, forming bacteria into the kombucha and fermenting it. So like the keeper grains, mm -hmm. that's what's going to convert and transform the milk into the thicker keeper drink, and this uh, will transform the tea from just the sweet sugary tea into a, a, like a vinegar flavored drink. Have you had kombucha before? Yeah. 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 So you're making it to make another one? Yeah. Okay. And every time you do a batch, um, I, get, I don't know if you saw in the other jar we had, there was a little film forming on top. And uh, eventually, if you leave it long enough, mm -hmm. It's going to form one of these. It gets thicker. Mm. It's almost like a piece of skin. <laughs> <laughs> and you could probably rip that into four pieces and have, get four. Yes. You probably could. I've never done that. I, um, but even just a little bit, if you like, you yeah. probably scrape some of that off of there. It's probably a good enough culture. But they're really easy to start on your own, too, if you just buy a bottle of kombucha and leave it out on the kitchen counter mm -hmm. for about a week. Uh, like three days to a week, you want to check it, and you'll see that it's growing a scoby. Uh, there it is. Mm -hmm. So we'll put half in each jar. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I got my dad a little kombucha kit. Kind of came with everything, and the scoby and everything, uh -huh. and a little... Um, had a little spigot on the oh, cool. deal because uh, he was having so many gut issues. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> he's got this funny thing. He, he drinks beer and he'll put a little splash of tomato juice or vegetable juice in his beer. Well, now that he's got the kombucha, <laughs> he puts the kombucha, kombucha in the beer. <laughs> <laughs> I can't stop drinking the beer. But I have more probiotics too. <laughs> he, he gave me one. He's like, here, drink this. Try this. Tell me what you think. I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> and he finally told me, and then he showed me. That I, you know, sent him the kombucha thing in the mail, so I've never seen it. And he showed me that what he was doing with it. That's like uh, in Austria, they do Kinder beer, which is like soda and beer. Oh, huh. interesting. Which you would think to pair. Make it fizzier. Really? Yeah. And um, I, I don't drink, but one of my teachers, I used to. That's why I don't anymore. <laughs> um, but one of my teachers, you know, has this whole path of uh, lead making, and because the alcohol is like a deli quick delivery system for your medicine. Finance. Okay. So you just make herbal teas, you know, with like reishi and elderberry and mm -hmm. elderflower and stuff, and then make it into a mead, you know, and that's a good way to get, you know, people who like to drink to drink the medicine. <laughs> you can actually get a really nice dry mead too. It's not so sweet. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't like drinking it with the sweet honey wine. We still make them, and uh, we'll drink it like that. Like we'll do it like medicine, like you know, like a thimbleful. Mm -hmm. you know? Like, um, but that originally, that's that was like one of the very first ferments, you know, of course, in Egypt was. Um, uh, meads and they used it to preserve shamanic medicine. Mm. They preserved psilocybin mushrooms in, in mead. Mm. Yeah. Um, and that then they just used that as, you know, a delivery system for all manner of herbs after that. And then they start 
making beers and stuff. Beers was were more like a gruel. It wasn't like a drink, you know, but it was still made like a medicinal drink. It had the hops, you know, it's like a nervine sedative kind of calm mm -hmm. down, mm -hmm. chill you out, you know, and it was uh, you know, a ferment like this where you got probiotic from it, you know. Um, so it's interesting the whole history and how many things there are that are ferments that are, we don't realize, like black tea and chocolate and like, you know, all the many kinds of like corn relish and pickled watermelon rinds and like, you know, just things from all over the world. Uh, Korean sauerkraut, Japanese sauerkraut, German sauerkraut, you know, uh, mm -hmm. kefir, just wherever you are, there's these interesting ferments. You know. What was that last bit of liquid you guys poured in there? That was the reserve kombucha. Mm -hmm. you know, it was actually not reserve kombucha, it was GT Dave's kombucha. Well, yeah. <laughs> in the recipe, it would, it would call the reserve kombucha kombucha from a previous batch, and we didn't have a previous batch ready of our own, so we used some store-bought kombucha. But you can also start this without a SCOBY, you just make your black tea, and you just pour a kombucha in there. And that, that, that'll get it going too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well you'd want to leave the kombucha out on the counter for a little while to sort of cultivate the mother, make it grow bigger. That will definitely help it mature, but you could even just do a fresh one, especially if it's got a lot of stuff at Yeah, because the, the ones from the store, they have the mother in it and it's already, you know, grown enough. But to have, you know, if it's your first time and you want to make be sure, sure it would successful, be, you want to leave it out on the counter for a while to grow more. It'll develop more. Or some, the, this batch we made with, maybe that might be why the, there was a funk in there too. Our son had left, had a house sat for us while we were in Hawaii, and he left a kombucha on the counter for like two weeks. And we were like, well, kombucha. <laughs> yeah, so we opened it up, just, we smelled it, we tasted it, it was fine. So yeah. I, I'm not quite sure that, that's the only thing I can think is that it came that from the, It was kind of furry. They had yeah. been like, you know, I don't know, drinking kombucha and hanging. Well, the stuff I poured into here, I had strained out, though it was, I didn't put all the muck mm -hmm. into there. But yeah, it's, we took that SCOBY out, we showed it to you earlier today, and then this one, we didn't even use one of the SCOBYs we already had, we just poured some of that kombucha onto there. But you can see the film forming on top there, and if I were to stick a spoon in there and scoop it up, there would be like this really thin scoby. You can even see there's like a little yeah. hanger here. So it's already growing and begun. And yeah, it's just the other days. And this I'll probably leave at least another week and check it again. Um, it's been there for about a week already. And I don't think that a week is long enough. But I made a note on here that, you know, this one had my other scobies and this one. Uh, had uh, the Turkish tea and the, the countertop scoby is what I called it because that's, you know, it, it was grown on the countertop instead of <laughs> from a previous batch. And I labeled the dates on here so I know when to check it. I'll leave it in the dark cupboard for the next week and I'll check it and then uh, leave it longer if I think it needs longer or I'll leave it for, you know, I'll, I'll just drink it like it is. The other cool thing with kombucha uh, that you've probably tried from the store is the flavored kinds. What they do is they do this ferment and then they strain, they take the scoby out, strain it off and do their next batch. And the stuff that they strained off, they add something like, say the mango flavored one, they add mango puree and then they cover it tightly instead of putting a cheesecloth over it and leave it for I forget what the amount of time is. But four can, or five days, I think, yeah, in the cupboard for right. a secondary fermentation. Yeah, so they call it a secondary fermentation. So it's, yeah, about a week, maybe, at yeah. the most. And uh, then when you open the lid, it's going to be effervescent and uh, fizzy, like the, like the hippie soda we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can flavor it by doing a secondary fermentation. Or you can you just... Can put the lid on it and stick it in your fridge and when you take it out it'll be effervescent. I like the fruit teas too. Yeah. You can brew it with the fruit yeah. teas and you get a little bit of flavor that way. That's too. just what I was about to say is, is you can totally on the just blend whatever flavors of teas in you want in mm -hmm. with your black tea. Yeah. And that way you kinda so that's yeah. Awesome. Is it is it possible to end up with a non caffeinated version? 
They, they, they most of the caffeine does get me. consumed oh, by the SCOBY, um, but there is still a little bit longer. in there. There's a little bit of sugar in there left too. A lot of people say, and you can test the pH. You can get like really scientific with it, and you know, like a like if you were brewing beer or other kinds of alcoholic drinks, you want to make sure that you're testing the pH and, and uh, the amount, the sugar levels. And probably in that, that case too, if you're trying to get like an alcoholic kombucha, for instance, or one that's really fizzy, you'd want to, um, instead of just measuring a cup of sugar, you'd want to measure it by weight instead of volume. Mm -hmm. So, But you don't have to use a caffeinated tea. You, you, you do need a caffeinated tea to start. Oh, yeah, the, the, the black it tea. Needs the, the Caffeine and the tannins from the black tea. More specifically, oh, okay. though, like the decaffeinated teas will have a little bit of caffeine, and you can use those. Okay. Um, it, it is more the tannins that you're going after. Hmm. Would it take longer if you used one of those? A decaffeinated tea? No. I mean, it takes the same amount of time. Yeah, yeah I really don't. Yeah, we've so only ever used caffeinated tea. Yeah. But I've, I've heard of a lot of people say they even just brew it with herbal teas. And they've had great success, but I haven't tried that myself. So I, I, I have some friends who use decaffeinated teas and herbal teas. Yeah, I've, I've used them before. But yeah. Seem to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it is just that same thing of like if you're going to use a different uh, uh, tea, just make sure that you replenish your scoby with the black tea and the white sugar every now and then. Yeah, as I know, it, 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 as I understand, it eats the tannins and stuff, but. I do think it's a lot like the vinegar, where it's just basically you get the starter going, and you, if you have sugar water, that's all it needs to. Yeah. Yeah. So, can experiment. Totally, it's like, you know, just play with it. And, you know, add, try the secondary fermentation, try different teas, try, you know. And, um, I was going to say that if, you know, if you go to the co op or whatever, get one of these full, it's like, you know, Ten or fifteen bucks or whatever, but you know, making that jar cost like maybe two dollars the most, if that. Fifty cents. Yeah. <laughs> For the sugar. It does take that time, you know, but it's not that much time. It mostly just sits there. You take yeah. it, you just brew some tea and throw thing in there and then set it on the shelf and then. Mm -hmm. So that scoby you can see floating in there, uh, it'll probably settle to the bottom or maybe it will float to the top, but another one is going to form on top. And uh, some people just keep all their scobies in the jar and just keep pouring kombucha over it and keep, you know, doing a, a pouring tea over it and making a new batch. Because um, every batch will grow you a new scoby and pretty soon you're going to not know what to do with them. <laughs> yeah, the jar is being full of scoby. Yeah, if yeah, you leave the scoby in there, they will get really thick. Uh, um, I just throw them in my compost. Yeah. yeah. You can feed them, them to your chickens. animals, you can put them in your smoothies, yeah. you can like do stuff with them. We did a little bit of that and I saw, yeah, I did see you recently, someone made a, a, a recipe, no, it was, I think it was scoby bacon. Oh, <laughs> like you know, they just cut it up and like yeah. fried it with like liquid smoke and maple syrup and like soy uh, sauce or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I've heard of uh, scoby fruit leather. They'll put it in the blender with uh, fruit. And, oh, good. Uh, I guess you mean yeah, probiotic fruit yeah. leather that way. Yeah. Oh. So you can find ways, you know, to work yeah. with it, and it's more probiotic. It's just yeah, another thing. It's. Funny how we are. I mean, we've been delving into all this dirt and fermentation, and like, you know, are totally feel comfortable there. But you get a big. There's so many little things like that. Like, you get a big fat scoby, and we're like, I don't know if I want to eat it. <laughs> yeah, know, it's like kind of weird. It's almost, you know, like, I guess it could be considered like vegan meat, but it's not really vegan because it's little creatures. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stuff vegans eat that they don't realize are <laughs> vegan. <Yeah. laughs> I, I get it. <laughs> so. so that's about it. Does anybody have any questions about anything? Review on the, uh, the, the apples. And so yeah. it was, oh, yeah. was vinegar? No, so I'm um, making apple cider vinegar, and the process is, uh, I, I think it's the same uh, proportion of three... Uh, quart, uh, three quarts of water okay. and a cup of sugar. Okay. And then uh, you, I filled up my, you know, half gallon thing, like three quarters of the way with 
you know, a couple slices, quarters, and what have you. Okay. And then you just pour that stuff over it and let it sit. And every couple of days, you got to stir it like Hannah's about to do now just to mm -hmm. See how it's that. brown above the water level? Mm -hmm. So push it down and you just push it down and stir it, it. To the top. and then um, uh, you let it sit for two weeks like that and then we'll pull the fruit out and then you just let it continue until whatever you know you could drink it sweet uh, or use it sweet but you know we're going to go for vinegar so we're going to wait till it gets so you're making apple cider okay yeah, yeah. You, you can water it down so it stays at five percent acidity um uh you can I forget how to test that exactly, but you know you can go the, base it the on the flavor, strips. and uh, yeah, using pH strips. Um, but if you have like a a jar of homemade vinegar that's been sitting there so long that it's going to continue to culture, um, and it's too acidic for you, you can just add a little bit of water to it. Hmm. So there, that's sufficient stirring, I think. Yeah. Sugar, water, and apples. Sugar, water, and apples. Yeah. <laughs> Sugar, water, and scoby. With tea. <laughs> and, and weight. That's, wow. yeah, that's I, what I love about all this. It's just, it's really quite simple. There's a lot of good online resources, too, like people making videos on kombucha and apple cider vinegar and keeper and all that. Well, I love this. I don't know how many times I've gone in a town. I'm like, ah, oh, there's that broccoli, and there's yeah. this in the fridge, and yeah, I'm like, oh, I don't know what to do with it. I gotta go. Yeah, <laughs> and, I, and then come it wouldn't, back to wouldn't, food. Yeah, it wouldn't take long to just chop it up, throw it in the jar, and You're like, yeah. Yeah. I'll be there when I get back. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, that's a really, uh, a really good thing to do. I hadn't thought about that. Like, if you need to travel, what do you do with all your veggies? All the stuff <laughs> in your fridge. Yeah, a little leftover. This is and that. You can just. Yeah. That's a great idea. I really like giving them as gifts too at Christmas. Like mm -hmm. you have this huge harvest and then you're like, what do I do with it? That's how much we can yeah. afford on Christmas. Like we'll give people <laughs> some, <laughs> some ferments from and herbs that we wildcrafted or we'll give them uh, fermented things or yeah, there's there's all kinds of things that can do with it. <laughs> yeah. So awesome. Thank you, Thank guys. You guys.